following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In our previous lecture, we discussed meditation. and the principles that we need to understand in order to develop a practical technique and for us to fully take advantage of our efforts to meditate and receive the benefit. Meditation is a state of consciousness that we have to um, gain experience with. And in order for us to reach that experience, we need to have a strong understanding of the factors that lead to it. And the first step that we should undergo in order to develop that understanding is to study. We need to rely on sources that are proven and that can be tested and experienced so we can have confidence that what we are relying on as a source of information can actually take us where we want to go. As an example, <clears throat> When we're born into this life, the only way that we can acquire the skill in order to survive is to learn from others. But we need teachers who know how to teach us what we need to know. We can't just go to anyone. In order for us to thrive and do well, we need a mother who loves us, and who puts her heart into providing to us the knowledge and techniques that we need. And this is especially true when we look at spirituality in this way. We have to be very clear about that. And it's, it's an irony, and it's a sad irony, that we can spend a great deal of time and energy researching and investigating a purchase that we have to make. Like if we're going to buy a car, or we're going to buy a computer, we'll spend months and months very carefully analyzing the purchase and talking to people who've bought the product we're considering in order to find out about their experience. And we'll do this with a house, with a car, but we don't do it spiritually. With spirituality, we leap right in to whatever we find without any thought of prudence or really investigating the teaching that we're taking into our mind. 
And this is why we see so many people and groups suffering. So many people that go for years and years being misled. This is a grave problem. And to investigate a teaching or a teacher or a book or a technique is not something you can do from books or the internet. You have to acquire your own experience. You have to have the ability to investigate something deeply, consciously, for yourself. And this is sort of a catch-22, because we're asleep. And we don't have the skills and techniques that we need. So the recommendation that we would, what we could rely on in this case is to not go with fly-by-night books, pop culture, the latest bestseller, but to go to the original sources to study the scriptures, to study the most ancient and proven techniques and philosophies in human history. And this is what Gnosis is all about. We're not interested in studying the latest trends or fads, and Gnosis is not a trend or a fad. This wisdom that we talk about in these lectures and that we study in the books is the most ancient wisdom on the planet. And it is so long-lasting because it works. Because it's real. It's effective. I gave you this little preface because I want to continue in the theme of the lecture about meditation without exertion. But in the, in the first lecture, we talked about principles, about a point of view. But for us to reach that point of view, we need to clarify a lot of things in our own mind. The, the reason that we can't meditate is because of our mind. It's not because of anything outside of us. The obstacle we face is ourselves. And that's what we have to clarify. And the teachings can help us with that clarification. So in order to aid us, I've selected a scripture that's very short, but is a miracle in its content, in its structure. It was written uh, in the 14th century. That was a long time ago, by our standards. And it's called the Three Principal Paths. This scripture is only 14 stanzas long. One page. It's very short. And it was written by Tsongkhapa. If you haven't heard that name before, I advise you to become familiar with it. Tsong Kapa was born in Tibet in the 1350s and took his first Buddhist vow at the age of one. And was quickly swept up into being educated in all of the open and secret teachings of Buddhism and received all the highest degrees and empowerments of that tradition. He went on to become the single greatest philosopher, intellectual, and organizer of Buddhism that has ever existed. He wrote more than 10,000 pages of commentaries about Buddhism he started the tradition of the Dalai Lamas. He revolutionized Tibet. He single-handedly brought Tibet out of a very dark time into what we would call in the West a period of enlightenment, of great cultural advance. He built monasteries. He started temples. He started the Gelukpa tradition. 
But the main thing that he did, the primary gift that he bestowed upon the world, was to clarify the teaching of the Buddha, which had become very fractured. And people were becoming, had become very confused about how to practice. So he managed to take all of the sutras and tantras, the baskets of teachings, and showed how they worked together, how they're organized, how to understand the teaching. And once you've studied and understood what Tsongkhapa taught, you can go to any scrap heap and find a page out of any scripture or any religion, and you can understand how it fits into the tradition. Now, this is remarkable because it's exactly what Samael Van Vior did. Samael Van Vior did it not just with Buddhism. He did it with all the scriptures in the world. And when you study Samael Van Vior, you gain the same thing that a Buddhist student gains from studying Tsongkhapa. The ability to understand the path comprehensively. Now, people who've studied Samael and Vior for a long time tend to forget this fact. That that's one of the most beautiful gifts you receive from him. Is that after studying him deeply, you can go to any book, any teaching, any school, and see how it fits into the big picture. This is a beautiful gift. Very powerful. The scripture that I'll quote from is called The Three Principal Paths. He wrote this short text and managed to condense all of Buddhism into it. There are hundreds and hundreds of scriptures in Buddhism. But the basic meaning from the beginning to the end of it is in this short scripture. You can read the whole scripture on the Gnostic Teachings website. It's there. The three fundamental paths, or the three principal paths that he explains in this scripture are basic Buddhism. And of course, Gnosis is the union or the expression of all religions, but most especially Buddhism and Christianity. And as Gnostic students, we need to know this. We need to know Buddhism and Christianity both in depth. In Buddhism, the teachings are organized on a graded path. And this is what Tsongkhapa did. He took all the teachings and he said, here is how you organize them. Here is how you practice them. This is the step-by-step -step progression. And this is the three fundamentals. One way of looking at them is how the teachings were organized by the Buddha. He gave teachings according to the levels of the listener. And there are many different degrees and different levels of teaching in the tradition of Buddhism, but also in all traditions. So these three fundamentals, as an explanation, comes from Buddhism. But as a point of view, or as a reference, applies to every religion. And what the Express is, to reach the highest goal, you need to work through three stages. And it's not like something in life where you go to school, and you go to kindergarten for a year, and then you go to grade school for a few years, and then you go to another school for a few years. This is not like that. Don't think of the three paths or the three vessels as something you graduate from one to the next. It doesn't work like that. It can give that impression, and some people think that way, but it isn't the case. A better way of thinking of it is a stepped pyramid. A pyramid that has three levels, or three steps. And in fact, you will see these three steps 
in all religions. Three steps up. But notice something. If you're going to stand on the top step, which of course is where we all want to be, you have to first step on the other two. And even once you are standing on the top, the only reason you can stand there is because the other two support you. This is really important. Because these three steps also correspond to the vehicles of any tradition, the yanas. We've talked about shravakayana, which commonly is called hinayana, but which is not a good term, it's derogatory. Hinayana is the common term, but Taravada or Shravakayana is the proper term. And this is the foundational path, the entry to religion. Every religion has a Shravakayana level. Shravaka means hearer or listener. Yana means vehicle or vessel. We all enter religion through that level. In the Shravakayana teaching, we get the basics the foundation, the fundamentals. You know what a fundament means or a foundation? It is the strength upon which the temple depends. That is, without that foundation, the temple cannot stand. Why is this important? Because the second level is what we call Mahayana, the greater vehicle. And this is when the teachings get deeper and go further. And on top of that is Tantrayana, which is also called Mantrayana, Vajrayana, and many other names. Every religion in the world, in its original inception, had these three degrees. In masonry, they are called apprentices, craftsmen or journeymen and masters. That comes from Egypt. But these three levels correspond to degrees of teaching. Now, of course, in the West, we're all so elevated and spiritually advanced that we believe we can leap right into Tantrayana and be masters and forget about the introductory levels. This is what we think. And this is why we find thousands of people leaping into tantric schools or so-called esoteric schools or so-called advanced schools. And when they leave those places or come out of those places, they are spiritually traumatized, damaged, ruined. This happens in the Gnostic tradition also. Many Gnostic groups who believe themselves to be very advanced, spiritually elevated, who ignore the principles of the foundational level and the Mahayana level. Where do we see this? I'll give you an example. In the first level, in the Shravakayana level of teachings, one is taught to take certain vows to cease harmful activities and to adopt beneficial ones. Simple examples. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs, don't sleep around, don't steal, don't kill. These are the Ten Commandments, the Vinaya, different types of vows or practices. Yama and Niyama in Hinduism. All religions have this. But once a practitioner is introduced to the secret heart teachings, or the highest Yoga Tantra, then they start working with sexuality. They have to start working into the depths of their ego, working on desire, working with temptation. So many of them start to drink, smoke, sleep around, all saying, quote, I'm a tantric, when in fact they are an idiot. This is all over the place. This is happening in Tibetan Buddhism. There are very well-respected monasteries and retreat centers and lamas who are leading this type of exercise. 
where they'll go and they'll meditate for an hour, and then they'll all go to the bar and get drunk. And then after they go into the bar, they'll all go back to the monastery and sleep with each other. This is not tantric Buddhism. Tantric practices of purity are built upon the foundation of the Shravakayana. You cannot separate them. And if you do, you're off the path. The ego is that strong. This is really critical to grasp. The ego is extremely clever and loves to play with these concepts in order to feed itself. The reason that I wanted to address this is because no matter how so-called advanced we are, we always need a strong foundation. Samael Amviora is an excellent example of this. He was, in my mind, the perfect renunciate. He perfected renunciation. And you see, renunciation is the perfect expression of Shravakayana, foundational level teaching. Now, many Gnostics like to proclaim Samael Amviora as the greatest master of Tantra. And this is true. He is a great master of Tantra. But he could not be that without being a master of Mahayana and, and uh, Shravakayana, the two levels that support Tantra. It would be impossible. You cannot become a master of Tantra if you ignore the foundations upon which it rests. In synthesis, these three levels of the baskets of teachings relate closely with the three fundamentals or three principles of the path, which Tsongkhapa explains in this scripture. The first principle is renunciation. We all hear this word renunciation when we study spirituality, and we think it means we have to stop drinking, and we might some people say, to be a real renunciate, you have to go live in the woods, or live in a cave, or go be a monk. This is not the real meaning of the word. Your physical circumstances have nothing to do with real renunciation. Zero. Real renunciation is a psychological state. It is a state of consciousness, not a state of physicality. You can prove it to yourself by visiting any monastery and trying to find a renunciate, a real renunciate. You can go and ask the abbot in charge of that monastery, do you have any real renunciates here? And if that abbot is sincere, he'll say, no. Because a real renunciate is one who has completely eliminated the ego. A Buddha. That is the only one. Until that time, we cannot abandon the teachings of renunciation. The second fundamental is bodhicitta. This is a Sanskrit word whose meaning is very deep. But for the purposes of uh, today's lecture, we'll synthesize it as saying that Bodhicitta relates to the wish to aid others to reach enlightenment. And the third fundamental of the path in Sanskrit is called prana. And this word loosely translated means wisdom. But wisdom specifically related with the absolute, the void, the emptiness, shunyata. These are the three principles. Renunciation, bodhicitta, prana. Renunciation, compassion, wisdom. Wisdom is built upon compassion. You cannot have prana if you do not have compassion. And true compassion, true love for humanity, cannot be had unless you have renunciation. 
These are not just dogmatic statements. These are practical facts of this teaching. And they can be demonstrated in your own life and when you observe and learn from others. For us to proceed, though, we need to understand something really important about this teaching in relation with meditation. In the previous lecture, we discussed how to truly meditate, to truly experience the truth, which is prana. You cannot make any exertion. In other words, the mind has to be in a perfect state of equanimity. Silence. But how do you reach that state? Especially when you look at the state that we have now, where the mind is completely out of control. Wild. And when we sit to try to reflect on something or meditate, we can't. The mind goes everywhere. We fall asleep. We get frustrated. We get distracted. We get despondent. We give up. How do we get there? How do we reach a point in which the mind is silent, we have peace, we have serenity, and then that explosion happens, that door opens, and we experience the truth? How do we reach that from where we are? By making effort. Not exertion. And this is the difference that we explained in the previous lecture. The effort that we need is a moment-to-moment activity of consciousness to be in a constant state of inner watchfulness to be watching our mind but mere observance doesn't transform the mind it initiates the transformation but it doesn't complete it the continual observance of oneself directs your energy inward your consciousness upon your own psychological state But what really empowers change is comprehension, understanding. So for us to get there, we need a technique called analytical meditation. In the teachings that we study from Samael and Vyor or from the Buddha or from Raja Yoga, from any tradition, There are many techniques of meditation, many styles, many approaches. And all of them have effectiveness and usefulness if you can understand how they fit into the big picture, if you can understand when they should be applied. And this is part of the confusion that we find in some schools where you enter into this school and everybody in the whole school is subjected to the same practice. This would be like going to the doctor, and no matter what your ailment is, they always give you the same medicine. It doesn't make any sense, right? Each of us has our need. Each of us has our illness, and we need medicine specific to that. But to receive that, you need to know the illness. If you don't know how you're sick and what you're suffering from, how can you apply an antidote? Thus, the first thing we need, analytical meditation. First, this is how you apply it. To analyze something in meditation is quite simple. You sit to relax. You isolate yourself from all external phenomena. You close your eyes. You turn your attention inwards and you bring that object into your imagination. If you need to understand a dream, a scripture, a pain, a doubt, this is what you do. You bring it to the screen of your imagination, you relax, and you analyze. For all of us who are beginners, this means that we are thinking about it. And this is okay. We are at the level where we are. So if you've had a situation in your life that troubles you, then you sit 
and you analyze that, you contemplate that, you think about it, but not thinking about it in the way you commonly do. Not just letting the mind run and build more worry. This is to think about it consciously. To think about it in the presence of the remembrance of your innermost. This is the distinct difference. You need to remember yourself. This is why when we perform a practice like this, it's always best to start with a prayer. To remember your Divine Mother. To remember your inner being. To pray. To chant a mantra. To do some pranayamas. To center yourself. To relax. Then you can begin to analyze the dream, the experience, the scripture, the lecture, the book, the situation. And to take it apart. This approach is, is uh, very effective and very helpful because it helps us to start to grasp and understand things. But again, it has to be done consciously. Attentive, with attention inside. And it's not easy. Anything that emerges in the mind, we have to become cognizant of. The Master Samael states many times in his books and lectures, anything that appears in the screen of the mind has to be analyzed. This is what we're talking about. A kind of analysis. I'm giving you this explanation because in order to understand the first level, you need this technique. Commonly, we associate the preliminary levels of spirituality, what we call shravakayana or foundational teachings, with techniques such as mantra repetition, yantra or yogic exercises, runic practices in the, in the Gnostic tradition, uh, preliminary concentration exercises, which are present in every religion, japa or prayer repetition, like saying the Hail Mary again and again or saying Om Namah Shivaya again and again whatever the practice happens to be. These are all typical Shravakayana level techniques. What is the purpose of them? The vast majority of spiritual people think those techniques take you to God. And that's all the technique you need. And that's because they've only been educated in that level. They don't know what those techniques are actually for. They don't know where they actually need to. And in fact, we find this in the Gnostic tradition as well, where instructors or students insist upon certain techniques over others. And the curious thing is, a lot of these people in different traditions really believe themselves to be experts and sincerely want to help others, and yet they have zero experience of the results of the practice they are promoting. Conscious experience, internal development, spiritual awakening. This is why we can go to Kundalini Yoga schools, Tantric schools, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, you name it. And find people who are very sincere and very enthusiastic, maybe sometimes aggressive, in pushing their technique or their approach. And yet, if you question them, if you ask them, have you experienced God? Have you talked to your innermost? Have you spoken with an angel? Have you eliminated an ego? Most will say, if they're sincere, no. Why? This is important. How do we put our trust and faith into a group or teaching or school who promotes Dharma but hasn't even experienced the first level of Dharma? How can we do that? We do. It's a mistake. As I explained, all of the techniques of the Shravakayana level are there in order to prepare oneself for the next level, which is Mahayana. 
the distinguishing characteristic of any Mahayana level teaching is compassion for others. But how does that compassion emerge? Genuine, true compassion for another person or for all of humanity. Not just, uh, you know, may all beings be happy. Or uh, like we always say at Christmas time, you know, peace and goodwill to earth or mankind or whatever. Right? We all say those things and we think those things, but when have we felt that flame in our heart? That flame of love for others that's so strong we could die. Who of us have felt that? That is bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is not a concept. Cognizant love, compassion, is not conceptual. It is a conscious emotion, a superior emotion. It is one of the most powerful emotions you will ever experience. But it doesn't come from reading books. It comes through comprehension. The reason that we learn to practice techniques such as the mantra repetition, runic practices, pranayamas, concentration exercises, is to begin to prepare our mind to begin to clarify our state of consciousness so that we can apply analytical meditation. Because the analytical meditation, where we sit at the end of the day and we observe ourselves and we look at our experience of the day and we say, wow, I had a lot of anger today. I need to analyze that. We do all those practices to prepare us for that moment. And then when you're really serious about analyzing life, the ego, suffering, how much pain we create for ourselves and how much pain we create for others, when you really comprehend that and really understand that, you start to really feel what suffering is and what causes it. In the previous lecture, I explained a little bit about the Four Noble Truths and that all suffering comes from desire. Intellectually, this is a fun thing to analyze. Interesting. But when you comprehend it in your heart, it's deeply painful. This type of understanding is what leads to real renunciation. So let me read a little bit from this scripture to put this in perspective. The scripture begins, I bow to all the high and holy lamas. This first line is important. In this line, the writer Tsongkhapa is indicating all of those who have accomplished what the scripture will explain. That this is something live. It's not theoretical. It's real. And the first stanza says, As far as I am able, I will explain the essence of all high teachings of the victors, the path that their holy sons commend, the entry point for the fortunate seeking freedom. Listen with a pure mind, fortunate ones, who have no craving for the pleasures of life, and who, to make leisure and fortune meaningful, strive to turn their minds to the path which pleases the victors. That's the first two stanzas. Each line, each word, has been commented upon by hundreds, maybe thousands of lamas in the Tibetan tradition. That's how important this scripture is. There have been hundreds of books written about this one short page where they analyze in depth each phrase because of how much potency is in it. These first two stanzas describe for us the conditions within which we need to establish ourselves. The point of view, the mindset that we need. 
This line says, listen with a pure mind, fortunate ones. I don't necessarily know who among us would consider ourselves fortunate. I think it depends on our point of view. Probably before the lecture, if someone had asked us if we considered ourselves fortunate, our mind would have immediately analyzed our financial situation. Right? That would be the first thing. How much money do I have? Am I wealthy? Am I doing well? Am I eating well? Do I have a lot of clothes? Do people love me? Do people respect me? Do they talk about me? These are the things that would have emerged in our mind at that moment. Now that we're in the lecture, it might be a little different. We might think, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm studying these teachings. Yeah, I'm fortunate. That's good. It's true. That's the intended meaning here. But we're fortunate for another reason. Not merely to receive the Dharma, which is a great blessing. But what this other line says, and who to make leisure and fortune meaningful. What does that mean? Again, before the lecture, if we had been asked, do you have leisure and fortune? None of us would say yes. We'd all say, no, no, I'm poor, I'm broke, I don't have any money, and I'm so stressed out. I don't have any leisure. It's all a lie. These are lies we tell ourselves. The truth is, we are extremely fortunate, and we have a lot of leisure, especially in the West, especially in North America. We are spoiled rotten. We have no concept of the true fortune that we have. Yet, if any one of us were to be teleported immediately into the streets of, of uh, Tibet or the Middle East or Africa, we would get a big awakening. A big awakening. And yet, that is the most superficial level of the meaning in this scripture. Because to have leisure and fortune is really the unique characteristic of any humanoid. Any person that has a humanoid body, what we in Gnosis call intellectual animals. Why? Because it's this level of evolution in which we first have freedom, relatively speaking, individual will. We can do what we want to do. We are given that right because we need to develop it in order to advance and become Buddhas or angels. Yet we squander it. What do we do with our individual freedom, our ability to choose our action? We feed desire. We behave like animals. Our only concerns are food and sex and money. And what is the result? This planet. Billions of people suffering for lack of money, for lack of food, and because of the abuse of sex. To enter into a humanoid body is to be given the opportunity to study the Dharma, to learn Gnosis, to become a master of oneself, and then later to become a master above to start to take responsibilities in the cosmic hierarchy. That is the fortune and leisure that we have. And how fleeting it is. How brief. And thus the line says, listen with a pure mind, fortunate ones, who have no craving for the pleasures of life and who make and who, to make leisure and fortune meaningful, strive to turn their minds to the path. The next stanza says, Without pure renunciation, there is no way to end this striving for pleasant results in the ocean of life. This is a very powerful line. 
And it underlines the entire range of the introductory levels of every religion in the world. So let me read it again. Think on this deeply. Without pure renunciation, there is no way to end this striving for pleasant results. The mind hears this and says, what? What's wrong with striving for pleasant results? Aren't we who are on the path striving for pleasant results? We are. But there's a difference between the mind striving for that and the soul. The mind striving for pleasant results is striving for desire. To satisfy the ego. The consciousness who has the pure mind, who is striving to turn the mind towards the path that pleases the victors, is seeking bodhicitta. Not pleasure for oneself. So the, the next part of that stanza says, it is because of their hankering life as well that beings are fettered. So seek renunciation first. So this stanza describes in a nutshell, in a brief synthesis, the entire Shravakayana teaching, which is simply those four noble truths that we talked about in the previous lecture. That so long as you are pursuing craving, you are creating pain. And as long as you are avoiding unpleasant things, you are sustaining them. This is the great pendulum of nature. It is a law of infallibility called invariance in physics. If you observe water, and if you drop something heavy on the water on one side, the whole body of water adjusts itself to accommodate the change. But then what happens? It moves back the other way and begin, keeps moving again and again in a wave-like pattern, in a pendulum swing, until everything eventually calms. The same thing happens with every action in your heart, in your mind, and with your body. This is a profound law of nature, which is the whole purpose of our first level in religion. To analyze that. To study our daily lives and to see how our actions produce results. What are the results we're experiencing? Why are we experiencing them? Because the causes are in us. So we analyze the result and the cause. The cause and the result. In order to understand how to behave properly. The next stanza says, Leisure and fortune are hard to find. Life is not long. This leisure and fortune doesn't refer to just having a trust fund. It doesn't refer to having a couple million dollars in the stock market. It's talking about having the leisure and fortune of having a physical body. Simply that. On the cosmic scale, that is an incredible fortune. It is also a great leisure. Because we can abuse it as we will. And we do. And the second part says, life is not long. None of us have cognizance of that. None of us truly comprehend that we are going to die. Not one of us. And thus, how can we claim to be great tantric practitioners or Mahayana Buddhists when we don't even understand the most fundamental teaching of every religion, which is, you will die. Death is unavoidable. Every single teaching 
in the world emphasizes this. And yet, every spiritual aspirant in the world ignores it. In the teachings of the Buddha, in the first basket, the first introductory level, Shravakayana, these are the basic things that every student needs to learn to meditate on karma, action and consequence, and to meditate on impermanence, and to meditate on death. Let us not have that arrogance that presumes we already understand those things and we can skip on to the next level. None of us comprehend these things. None of us really comprehend impermanence. If we did, we'd be free of suffering. If we really understood that we were going to die, we wouldn't be wasting our time on so many stupid, pointless activities. And yet we all do. What is the fruit spiritually of watching television? What is the spiritual fruit of wandering around in the shopping mall? What is the spiritual fruit of browsing around on the internet? If you were to do a detailed analysis of how you've spent your time, even just for the last week, and you were strictly sincere with yourself, and you made two columns, two lists, one list that shows everything that will benefit you spiritually, and the other list is everything else, which one will be longer? Simple question. But it must be answered, especially when you comprehend that you will die. Who here knows when they will die? Anybody in the back? Yeah. I strongly recommend to you that you meditate on your death. It's one of the most potent, powerful, inspirational meditation practices that exists. And yet we're all terrified to do it. Even though it's the most basic and the first practice you learn in Buddhism. The first one. And here we have all these students running around thinking they're experts of Tantra. They haven't even done the first practice of the basic level. That is absurd. But it's a fact. We need comprehension of death. And this is why Samuel M. Vior focused on it so much. So many books, so many stories, so many examples about death. It wasn't accidental, and it wasn't just for fun. It's because we need to understand that. When we understand let me read the next stanza and then I'll continue. I'll read this whole stanza again. Leisure and fortune are hard to find. This physical body. To exist in a physical body. Life is not long. Think it over constantly. Stop desire for this life. For me, at my level, that's all I need from this scripture. And we're only in the fourth stanza of 14. Because I have still a lot of desire for this life. I still want comfort. I want security. I have pride. I have anger. I have all these defects related to this life. I can't accomplish this line. Stop desire for this life. I'm not there. How can I keep reading this? I'm not there. But I'll read it anyway. 
think it over. The next line says, think over and over how deeds and their fruits never fail. Action and consequence never fail. This is Shravakiana teaching, foundation level teaching. In the Bible it says, ye will reap what ye sow. That's karma. Simple, pure, but none of us grasp it. Because we continue to perform actions that produce suffering. Now, physically, especially once we become, quote, spiritual, physically we hide those things. We try to act like we know better. We don't want to show people what we really are inside. So we act spiritual. That's normal. But inside, in the mind, we're angry, vengeful, proud, stuck up, full of ourselves, judging other people, condemning everyone. Envying everyone, coveting what they have, full of fear, consumed by anxiety. None of that is spiritual. A truly spiritual person is in equanimity, peace, and radiates love even to their enemies. None of us have that. None of us have the right to act like we are that when we are not. Think over and over how deeds and their fruits never fail. Let us think about that for a moment. Action and consequence. Karma. We, quote, spiritual people, take this idea for granted. We think we grasp it. Because we've studied the word. We may have read a couple of books about it. We've heard Samael and Vior talk about karma a lot. And we think, oh yeah, I, I get karma. I know what karma is. Sorry, wrong, you don't. None of us do. Comprehension is proven through your actions. Should I repeat that? Comprehension is proven through your actions. Not through your intellect. Not through the mind, not through your words, not through your pantomime of spirituality. Through your actions in your heart, in your mind. Samael said, what matters most is not how treat people treat each other visibly, but how people treat each other invisibly. Very profound. Certainly I cannot measure up to it. Karma. Every single motion of matter and energy produces a consequence. There are four basic rules that we need to grasp about karma, and these are important. You might want to write them down. The first one, actions produce relative consequences, related consequences. Let's put it that way. When you perform an action, there will always be a consequence that is related to that action. That's a law. Right? Basic karmic law. That's the first one. We need to look at that in our lives. This is where we can apply this analytical meditation that I was describing. Analyze the consequences you're experiencing in your life. Where, how are you suffering? In the evening at home, in the morning before you leave for your day, analyze yourself. How am I suffering? What are the consequences that I'm bearing? Look at that. Analyze that. And then look to see what actions could produce that. Because nothing is accidental. This is the first rule for a Gnostic. Nothing is an accident. Nothing is coincidence. Now we know there is a law of accident, but it's rare. What is most common is the law of karma. 
So we have to analyze ourselves, our mind, our suffering, our problems, our pains. And look, what action could produce this? Number two. You're not going to like this one. Consequences are greater than the action. I'm going to read that one again. Because I know the mind hates this one. The mind says, no way. Can't be like that. I don't buy that at all. Sorry. I'm going to prove it to you also. Consequences are greater than the actions. Think about that. Now, I explained to you this law of invariance. And I gave you the example if we drop something into water, and the water makes the waves. And the wave is water moving up so that the water where the impact occurred goes down. It's a pendulum swing. You all see that, right? It goes up and down on other sides. Yet, think about that. When the object strikes the water, there's a certain amount of water displaced, correct? But it goes out in a ring. Far more water is affected than the impact point. Do you grasp that? When the stone hits the water, we think in our mind that the only thing affected is the water that the stone touches. That is not true. All of the water in the whole area is affected. It all moves. And the same is true with your anger, with your pride, with your lust, with your envy. The same law applies. When you feel that explosion of covetousness, that is the stone touching the water in your heart. But those ripples flow through your three brains. They flow to your spouse. They flow to your children. They flow to your coworkers. They flow to your family. They flow to every person who comes in contact with you. They affect your household. They affect your workplace. They even affect your clothing, your bedroom. They affect everything. The consequence of that anger, of that covetousness, of that pride, irradiates out in waves upon waves, especially if you keep feeding it. That energy is flowing and flowing and flowing, saturating every atom in your body and saturating every person that you pass near. And thus you wonder why when we walk around our cities, there's so much pain and so much suffering. Because we produce it. We don't realize that consequences are greater than the action. But let me explain something to you. The converse is true. If you perform a good deed, the consequences are greater than the action. This is the secret. This is why sacrifice is the greatest aspect of the three factors. Yes, we need death psychologically. Yes, we need birth spiritually. But most of all, we need to sacrifice for others because that action produces consequences far greater than the original action. That is how we can transform the world. By understanding karma, the first level, shravakayana. Basic. I'm only on number two. Number three, you cannot receive the consequence without committing its corresponding action. You can't go to jail unless you committed a crime. You can't receive your payment unless you performed the work. Simple. What does this mean? If you want to be rich, you need to earn your money. This is a very superficial and foolish 
idea or example, and yet we all suffer from it. We all think there's got to be a trick, a way I can get rich overnight. And Americans are the stupidest ones of all in regard to this. Because all the Americans are thinking and developing these concepts and ideas, tricks. How to get money right away. That's what all these commercials are about. If you sign up for my seminar, my program, or get my book, you will get rich really fast. Doing real estate, doing investing, whatever the concept or idea, the hook is, it's all lies. You know why? Because the only one getting rich is the one selling it. The only one. But we have this psychological weakness because we don't understand karma. We also think we can trick our way into heaven. We think, well, if I believe in Jesus, that's it. I'm done. How y'all doing? Right? Millions of people believe this. Nothing in the entirety of God's creation reflects that. Nothing. God doesn't make exceptions to the law. The law is the law. Spirituality functions in accordance with laws. You cannot get something that you didn't earn. but you will get what you deserve. That's why the Bible says, whatever you sow, whatever seeds you put in the earth, that's what you're going to get back. But think about it. The seed is tiny. You put that little seed in there, but what comes out? A big plant, a big tree. The consequences are greater than the action. This is only number three. And we're still only in the fourth stanza. You can see how much work we have to do. Number four. You're not going to like this one either. Once an action is performed, the consequence cannot be erased. We really don't like that one. Because we love to get away with things, to think we can cheat everybody, be sneaky, Let our mind dwell on those lustful images. Let our mind dwell on our resentment towards our mother or father or our boss or our wife or husband. We love to indulge in our grievances and our pleasures. We always forget that they have a consequence too. Now, this statement has to be understood in context with the other three. Because this number four says, once an action is performed, the consequence cannot be erased. This is a fact. Everything you do is permanently a part of nature. Done. You cannot erase it from the memory of nature. However, a superior law can transcend that law. In other words, if you perform an action whose consequence will be painful, you can then perform a superior action whose consequence will be superior to that pain. Thereby, you transcend it. Does that make sense? The idea is quite simple. If you feel anger towards someone and you say something angry, that person's going to get upset. But if you realize it and you apologize sincerely, the problem solved, right? If the person accepts it, if they feel and, and accept your sincerity and truly accept the apology, they don't need to have revenge on you. It's solved. The same is true spiritually. This is why we have to perform good deeds in order to conquer 
all of the karmas that we can to pay our karma, to pay our debts, to be free of pain. Not every action can be erased in that way, but many can. Many can be um, absolved, you might say, or cleared. The record is there, but it doesn't mean you have to suffer the consequences for every action. You don't, if you perform good deeds, if you work with the law. This has to be understood. We have a lot of ideas about spirituality. A lot of um, things that we have inherited or heard or were told to us, explained to us. We need to clarify our minds. There's a story that's told. Um, that relates to this really well. But before I tell it, let me explain one more point, which is these painful things that I've been talking about are all the first level to really see how our emotions, our thoughts, and our actions not only make us suffer, but make others suffer. When we grasp that, it's painful. It hurts. Now, the story is this. There was a great lama in Tibet who lived in isolation. and was quite old. And occasionally other lamas would come visit him. And when these guests would come, he would ask them, Oh, have you heard anything about so-and-so lama? How is he doing? And the visitor would say, Oh, he's doing so well. He's building temples, stupas. He's printing dharma books. He's spreading the teachings everywhere. So the great lama would say, oh, wonderful, wonderful. But isn't it great to practice genuine dharma? And then later another visitor would come, another lama, and this old lama would say, oh, have you heard about this other lama? How is he doing? And the visitor would say, ah, oh, he's teaching. He has many students. He's doing well. And the old man would say, Oh, good, good. But isn't it great to practice genuine dharma? And then later another visitor would come, another lama. And this old man would say, Ah, have you heard about such and such lama? How is he? And the visitor would say, He's doing very well. He's in a strict retreat in the mountains, meditating and doing mantras for three years. And the Lama would say, oh, good, good, good. How, but isn't it nice, isn't it great to practice real Dharma? Later, one more Lama came to visit. And the old man says, how is so-and-so doing, this other Lama? And the visitor said, ah, that guy, all he does is sit around, pull his robe over his head and cry. And the old man says, oh. He is practicing real dharma. Why is that? Those tears, that crying, was not a cry of pity, self-pity, or remorse. Those are tears of compassion. That is the entry into Mahayana, the second level. By really comprehending suffering, the causes of it, why it happens, and how we ourselves are responsible causes 
quite naturally to emerge in oneself remorse. The urge, the longing to change. This is important and necessary. But by really going deeper, by really meditating on that, the doorway appears to the second level of any religion, which is to comprehend that all people, all beings, everywhere in existence are suffering. We need to help them. We, who have a tiny glimmer of understanding about our own cause, the way we ourselves have created suffering and made them suffer, need to help them. How many of us have truly comprehended the immensity of suffering? None of us. Because as soon as the lecture is over, we go out skipping around, dancing, and running from place to place, and eating lots of food, and having a great time. Until we have to go to work, and then we're in pain. Or we have to go home to our spouse, and then we're in pain. <laughs> but we don't really grasp suffering. This is not a concept. This is a reality. Now. We're all comfortably listening to this lecture. We have a great fortune and leisure to sit around and listen to me talk. That's extraordinary. Do you know what a small fraction of the beings on this planet have that? How few people can afford to listen to this lecture? Very, very few. Because they are bound by karma. That's why this line says, they are fettered. Beings are fettered. What are they fettered by? Desire. Desire that produces consequences that bind us because of the simple law of action and consequence. But desire as a term doesn't encompass what we need it to encompass. So let's, let's talk about these psychological factors that bind us to suffering. In Buddhism, they're presented as eight worldly concerns. A great Buddhist master named Nagarjuna explained them beautifully in this scripture, and I'll read his statement. He said, By the eight worldly concerns we mean the worldly thoughts from receiving, one, gifts or no gifts. This is to acquire what we want, desires, things, sensations. That's one and two, gifts and no gifts. Three and four is comfort and discomfort. Feeling good, feeling bad. Five and six, fame or notoriety? Notoriety. To be well known or not. And seven and eight, praise or criticism. Those are the eight worldly concerns. They sound simple. They are not. Many people, maybe some of us, I'm not going to point any fingers, many people think, when they read this eight worldly concerns, that it doesn't apply to them because they believe they are renunciates. They have renounced the world. Thus, they are not concerned with the world so they don't have these eight worldly concerns. What a lie. What a deception to put on oneself. Worldly concerns relates to the mind. These are concerns in the mind. It doesn't matter if you're a monk, or an abbot, or a lama, or a yogi. 
How do we know that's true? Look at all those monks and yogis and lamas and spiritual practitioners who do a lot of practices and they build a lot of monasteries and they attract a lot of students. And in the back of their mind, the reason they're doing it is to be famous, is to be respected, to be admired, to be talked about. It's pointless. You know why? Because when they die, nothing will have changed. They'll continue to cycle in the wheel of samsara. So the point is, it makes no difference for you to spend your entire lifetime in meditation, in a cave, chanting mantras, bringing thousands of students, if in the end your mind is poisoned by any one of these eight desires. Because that one desire keeps you tied to the wheel of samsara and you will come back. That's how severe the law is. The mind has to become completely free from desire. 100%. Only then can you step off the wheel. This is why we see many spiritual teachers, people who may be born young, and at, I mean born, but at a young age, are already being carted around as a spiritual incarnation. Or by, by their past karma are immediately put into the forefront of big movements or groups. Because in the past they did some work. Big deal. Do they still have the ego? Do they still have pride? Do they still have desire for comfort? Then they too are condemned to suffer until they change that. All of us have that. So let's not worry about all those teachers and lamas and other people. Any of us can do this analytical meditation and see in ourselves. We have a desire for comfort. We have a desire for fame. We have a desire to get things that we want to get. And we suffer when we don't get them. There's another story that's coming in my mind about, uh, again, it's a llama. Sorry for so many llama stories that are just coming in my mind today because I'm studying the scripture. Who... saw another monk, and this monk was devotedly doing his practices. And the Lama would say, you know, uncle, I'm so glad to see you doing your circles around the temple and doing your prostrations, but it's not real Dharma. And this monk was starting to get frustrated. Because every time he'd see the Lama, the Lama would say, I'm really glad to see you meditating, but it's not real Dharma. So finally the monk said, I give up. I'm doing my mantras. I'm doing my meditation. I'm doing all my practices. What do you mean I'm not doing the Dharma? What do I have to do? And the Lama looked at him and said three times, give up on this life. Give up on this life give up on this life. He's not talking about commit suicide. He's talking about deal with those desires in your mind for this life, for pleasure, for comfort, for things, for name, for fame. All those desires that make impure all of your spiritual exercises. That is the key. Renunciation. That's why it is the foundational level. Renunciation. 
So this scripture says, Think over and over how deeds and their fruits never fail, and the cycles suffering stop desire for the future. The previous stanza said, stop desire for this life. This one says, stop desire for the future. Then it continues. When you have meditated thus and feel not a moment's wish for the good things of cyclic life, and when you begin to think both night and day of achieving freedom, you have found renunciation. That is the entryway to real meditation, to real spirituality, real renunciation. So what is this saying here? When you have meditated thus, okay, we need to stop right there because most of us would read this scripture and go, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. renunciation, okay, I get it, cool. <laughs> and we toss it aside and we forget it. Right? How many thousands of pages of scripture have we all read? How many thousands of books, hundreds of books have we all read? How many have you comprehended? I don't mean intellectually. Remember what I said? Comprehension is proven in actions. How many of them do you live? Not just pantomiming them in your day-to-day -day life and when you're in front of other spiritual people. Do you live it from your heart, even when you're alone? That's comprehension. You can only reach that through meditation. The only way is to meditate, to comprehend, to understand it, so that it's in your atoms, it's in your bones. You cannot conceive of acting another way because you know how to act, how to be, how to live. That is comprehension. You see, when we say you need to comprehend your ego, you need to comprehend your pride, it means you cannot even conceive of letting that demon into your mind stream for even the space of a needle. You can't even conceive of it. It's inconceivable. You would never allow it. That's comprehension. None of us are like that. We hear that demon of lust or that demon of alcohol or that demon of drugs or that demon of smoking or that demon of greed or envy knocking on our back and we say, oh, oh yeah, I remember you. What are you saying? Hmm, interesting. Let me think about that. Let me meditate on that. Hmm, maybe I should have a drink. I'm a Gnostic. I can transform it. Maybe I should look at that pornography. I'm a Gnostic. I need to comprehend this lust. Idiot. Yet everyone does it. Allowing these demons to run around in our mind stream and pollute our practice. It's because we don't comprehend them. We don't understand them. And that's why I said Samuel and Vior was a perfect renunciate. Very severe. We all think he was severe in his writing and his way of talking. No. I'm sorry. What you see there is the love of his being. But you see nothing of his severity. nothing. The severity of Samael is devastating. It's incomprehensible. He is the angel of Geburah, justice. His severity is the severity of the law of karma. It is the most severe in existence. When we look at the tree of life, he carries that sword of severity. There is no greater severity, and yet he is our teacher. Who among us lives by that example? Embodying that severity towards one's own mind. That conquering of the ego. None. All of the Gnostics indulge 
and pride, seeking for fame, competing with each other, spreading the noxious pollution of politics, corrupting schools and instructors with politics, with garbage. They are destroying the work of Samael, not enlivening it. And not just with politics, but with poisonous doctrines that they mix. We need renunciation. We need to comprehend the teachings, to embody them. This is how you become a master of meditation. It isn't by sitting up in front of a group and having people admire you. It isn't by pontificating. It isn't by writing books. It isn't by building temples or schools or getting a lot of students or building a big movement. No, it is by dying. It is by the ego dying every day. We need this foundation in our practice. We need the first fundamental, renunciation, mystical death. Nothing else can happen without that. You'll know you have renunciation. As it says in this scripture, when you feel not even a moment's wish for the good things of cyclic life. In my experience, I've only met very small handful of people who have that, and I'm not one. And those people are like some of your. He's one. There is not a speck of desire for cyclic life. A speck of desire for comfort, for fame, for pleasure, for cappuccinos, hot dogs, chocolate, cornbread, beer, a big house, a nice car, a big group, a big spiritual movement? No. You will know you found renunciation, it says here, when you begin to think both night and day of achieving freedom, spontaneously, in your blood. Not because you just read something or heard a lecture and you get fired up, but because in your blood, blood and your heart and your bones, you comprehend suffering. This is the quality of mind, a quality of consciousness that is required to enter the Bodhisattva path. If you do not have this quality, you will never grasp the next level, which is bodhicitta. It's impossible. You might get the concept. You might get it in your intellect. But you will not experience it. Renunciation has to be extremely solid, pervasive. It has to become your characteristic. This is why Samuel M. Vior said, we have to become like the lemon. You know, when you, have you ever tasted a raw lemon just by itself? Taken a lemon and put it in your mouth? Nothing can stand against that taste, right? Nothing. When you put that lemon in your mouth, it wipes out everything else. Everything. You can't override it. That is renunciation. That's what he is talking about. He's not saying you have to be bitter to each other, which is how some people interpret it. You have to be bitter like the lemon and cruel. No. Samael is not cruel. Severe, yes. But remember, Samael is the logos of Mars. The virtue of Mars is love. The antithesis is war, hate, violence. But the virtue is diligence and cognizant love. It is severe. Because of love. 
Sometimes I'm criticized because my lectures are a little fiery. I accept that. But understand that it comes from one thing. I'm experiencing this, and I want you to benefit from it. That's it. Take it or leave it. It's from love. Cognizant. So renunciation is not something you can fake. We all try. We go out with our friends and maybe there's a Gnostic around or another spiritual person and there's beer or pot and we act like a renunciate. No, 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 I don't do that. But in our mind, the desire is there, isn't it? We may be thinking about that for a while later on. That desire keeps coming in the mind. Maybe I can have a little. Remember how good that used to be? Remember how much I used to love doing that? We all indulge in that way of thinking, especially when it comes to sex. All these people walking around like big shots, Gnostics, and other spiritual people, like they're all in chastity, but in their mind, what are they thinking? They're remembering when they used to have the orgasm and how much they enjoyed it. And they replay their experiences in their mind and replay them, indulging in those experiences in their mind. Thinking, there's no consequence. They have zero comprehension of karma. They have zero comprehension of all the most fundamental aspects of tantra. They are not tantrics. And of course, all of us are victims of that, guilty of that. Let us not claim to be something we are not. Renunciation, as I stated, proves itself through actions. Not just physically, but in the mind. Someone who has truly comprehended fornication will not even approach it in their mind. That is how you comprehend it in all the levels of the mind. And not just fornication, but greed, envy, covetousness, fear, pride. Pride is a noxious poison. But we like it. Where there is pride, there is no renunciation. Where there is vanity, where there is envy, where there is covetousness, where there is fear, where there is anxiety, where there is stress. There is no excuse. If we seriously want to achieve the goal of our spiritual path, we need to become severe like that lemon. Not severe with each other, severe with ourselves. We need to renounce the mind, to conquer it. But this doesn't come through mere rejection. Samael Amvior said very beautifully in the book, Fundamentals of Gnostic Education, if you simply reject something, later it will come back even stronger. You know why he said that? Because he understood the law of karma and those steps that I explained, that the consequence is greater than the action. Repression is an action. Avoidance is an action. And thus, when you see in your mind pride or lust or fear, and you avoid it, you repress that desire, you only strengthen it. And it will come back later even stronger. We have observed many people who've come into the Gnostic teachings full of fiery enthusiasm and who make dramatic sweeping changes in their personal lives abandoning alcohol and drugs and sleeping around, all those types of different behaviors that produce suffering for them. And then a year goes by, maybe two, and all of a sudden they disappear. And we always wonder, what happened to them? And later we find out. 
They're back in the same old routine, but worse. Because they didn't comprehend anything. They just repressed it. But it became stronger. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen that. And I'm new in this tradition. And I've seen it more times than I can count. And it's because those people failed to comprehend the most basic level of the teaching. They thought they were big shot tantric practitioners because they heard of Gnosis. They read a few books. Maybe they started teaching. They didn't comprehend anything. If they comprehended it, it would live in their actions. But what are their actions? They left the teaching. They started drinking again, sleeping around again, doing drugs. Some of them are dead. We don't acquire this teaching for free. You can't just walk in and out. Your being has had to go through an enormous amount of effort to put you in this teaching, to expose you to it. When you walk away, to be honest, I'd prefer not to talk about that. It's too painful. It is a tremendous responsibility. That's why that severity is so critical. That's why renunciation is so critical. It's not a game. We have to be serious. Every day, analyze what you study, what you do. Don't just read scriptures and the books of Samael and the, and the teachings of the Buddha or Tsongkhapa and just toss it aside. Meditate. I hear many students saying, but I don't know how to meditate on something. How do you do it? I just explained it. Sit down, close your eyes, and think about it. Start there. Think about it. Digest it. Analyze it. Look at it in context of your life. Compare it. Take it apart. Put it together. You need to digest it. In the mind, yes, but mostly in the consciousness. You need to digest it. Take it into your being so it will become part of you. Why do we encounter so many people from different traditions who are bad examples of their traditions? Because they don't comprehend their own tradition. We recently observed a person coming to the Gnostic group proclaiming that their tradition was the best. But their proclamation was filled with sarcasm and bitterness. It's ironic, isn't it? That they embrace their sarcasm and their anger as an example of why their tradition is so good. Strange, isn't it? or groups that proclaim that their group is the best, and they act full of pride, insisting that everyone come and join them because they are the best for this and that reason. And everything is filled with pride and condemnation of others. Remember the story I told you about the lamas building temples, going on retreats? The only one practicing real dharma was the one crying Who among all of these groups and teachings and teachers really demonstrates in their actions that they comprehend suffering and compassion? That should be your measure. Not who's got the big name, who's famous, who's got the most students, who's got the most schools or teachings or teachers or books or the, the most highfalutin lineage. In their actions... Jesus told us that. You shall know them by their fruit, not by what they say. And we are judged in the same way. In the end, when that inevitable death approaches, we will not be judged because of what group we belong to, just in the same way as we won't be judged by the color of our shirt. We will be judged by what we did, 
by the consequences of our actions. In the book um, Hell, Devil, and Karma, Samal Enviur said, it is the results of our actions that matter. We are judged for the results. Our actions, even if we have the greatest intentions in the world, mean nothing if the results are catastrophe. There are a lot of people with great intentions. We all have good intentions. Who among us has bad intentions? None of us. We all want to do good. We all want to be good. But our actions prove that we are not the results of our actions. We need to analyze that. Every day, analyze our behaviors. So we teach a practice called retrospection. Every Gnostic school in the world should know this practice and teach this practice. Retrospection. Yet it is not the property of Samael Amir. He did not invent it. Retrospection is Tibetan. It is present in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Even Tsongkhapa taught this practice. It is present in the teachings of the Buddha. And it is present in every religion, in its heart and core. I've attended a Zen temple where they taught retrospection. The practice is very simple. Every day, at the end of your day, spend some time reflecting on your day. Review it with your imagination. You can spend as much or as little time as you feel is necessary. It could be a few minutes. It could be a few hours. But if you're serious about wanting to uncover why you suffer and how to reach God, you need to analyze yourself because the answers to both are within. The answers are not in books. You can't get the answers from your teacher or from your friends. You can only get the answers by observing and analyzing your mind. You can do some preliminary practices to prepare for that. And I recommend it. Especially at the end of a day when you've come from work or your daily activities and you've got all that energy buzzing. You need to calm down. You could take a shower or a bath, take a walk, clear your mind, relax, get some exercise. Have a light meal. Don't eat a heavy meal before you sit to meditate because you're not going to be comfortable and you'll fall asleep. Your body will distract you. Do some pranayamas, do some mantras, do some chanting, do some exercises, runic or Tibetan, something to help you center yourself, steady or stabilize your energies, and relax. And then once you're really relaxed and calm, sit down and begin to replay the events of the day in your imagination. It's not so much to think about it, but to replay the events to review them like a movie. And it's very effective to do that backwards. To start with sitting down to meditate and start to go backwards through all the events and observe it in your mind like you are an actor who you're watching. Look at yourself like you're an actor. And go back and review everything, step by step. Slow or fast doesn't matter. Up to you. But follow your intuition. And watch how your mind tries to change what happened, because it will. You'll start to remember that moment when you saw that man who was so attractive, and you thought, oh, if only I could be married to a guy like that. But then when you remember it in your mind, you start thinking something else. Your mind changes the memory. Or you start to reflect on an argument with have with somebody, and instead of remembering what they said that was true, you can only remember your resentment. See how your mind starts to change and play with your memories. It's a very important thing, because it will, inevitably. And analyze yourself. That is the basics. From there, there is a lot you can do, 
a lot you can learn. But you need to practice it first. You need to learn how to do it. And the more you learn, the more you practice, the more we can teach you. And the more you can teach yourself. But make no mistake, this practice is real, and it works if you use it. It will lead you to a great deal of understanding about yourself and about life. And the result of it is love. When you start to really see your own behaviors and your own actions and how you affect people, you will start changing because you want to and you don't want to be that person anymore. You don't want to be that person. You want to be better. This isn't fake. It's not something that you're doing just to show off. It's doing something sincere. So when you master that, then we'll go to the next level. We'll talk about bodhicitta. But you can't grasp bodhicitta until you really know what it means to renounce, to feel that remorse, and to stop acting in stupid ways. Hmm? Any questions? That's a good question. Uh, the question is about fortune and leisure of having a physical body, and what about those who suffer physical and mental ailments or disfigurements? Well, firstly, we have to comprehend that every single particle of our existence is due to past actions. Everything. Everything about your body, about your circumstances, about your life, is because of how you yourself acted previously. There are no exceptions. When you understand that, then you can really start to meditate on your life, on your body, on your mind, on your heart, and see the causes, right? For people who are born with disfigurements, it's due to karmic causes, causes that they themselves produced in the past, and that resulted in those consequences. Why does that happen? Firstly, it happens because it's a law of nature. Nature has to do that to balance energy. That's the basis of this law in variance in physics. And that's why water makes those motions. It, it takes the energy that hit it and moves itself in order to balance all those forces and become back into a state of equanimity. And this is true in every level of nature. It happens in gases. It happens in solids. It happens in liquids. It happens in the ether. When you push against a force, that, por that force pushes back, but there's more consequences all around it, right? It isn't equilateral. So those people who are suffering disfigurement or ailments are paying their karma. Not out of vengeance, because it's the law of nature. If they ignore it, once the karma is paid, they're back where they started. Simple. For example, if you get a ticket, or you get convicted of a crime, you go to jail, or you pay your fine. But after that, you're back where you started. You don't get anything else. You just pay your debt. And then you're free of the debt, but you're back with zero, right? It's the same in the law of karma, the same in nature. Yet, if the person who has an ailment, mental or physical, were to comprehend the karma, to really understand it, then things would be different. They would get something. They would get comprehension, wisdom, knowledge. And there are cases like that. We can observe cases. Uh, I've met several people with... Um, physical and mental disabilities or problems who understand it, comprehend it. They can't necessarily explain it with the intellect, but emotionally and consciously, they get it. One man in particular that I know, 
who I have enormous respect for, intellectually is disabled. Intellectually, he doesn't have the power of retention or attention to study things and remember them. But in his actions, he shows great comprehension. He's very kind. Personally, I'd rather hang around him than a know-it-all spiritual person who's cruel. And there are a lot of them. Right? A kind person, a good person, is better to be with, simply. He has more comprehension. I respect that. Another question in the back? Is not desiring no desire itself a desire? <laughs> I love those word games. <laughs> is not desire is desiring to not have desire just another desire? Yeah, if it's in the intellect. We have to make a difference between what we mean by desire as a cause of suffering and desire as a cause for happiness. We generally use the word desire to connotate causes of suffering because that's 97% of what we are. Desires that are selfish and rooted in grasping at an ego. We have a small percentage, we say an average of 3%, of consciousness that is not trapped in those types of aggregates. It's what we call the essence or the buddhattadattu. It's a kind of free consciousness or the tathagatagarbha in Tibetan terms. That also has what we might call a desire or a longing. And those are multifaceted. If you look at, for example, the person I was talking about, that person has a sincere desire to help other people. This is beautiful. It's a cognizant part of him, conscious. Well, you can call it desire if you want, but what will the consequences of that act be? Will he suffer from that? Will the law punish him because he wants to help others and be kind to others? No, because the consequences always relate to the action. Remember the four steps I explained. Thus, we need to apply that law of karma to understanding what desires are and what they are not and what is good and what is not. In every case, no matter what our intellect says or the terms we use, what matters is our actions, how we act, how we behave, what we think and what we feel. That's what matters. We can call it desire or not. It's irrelevant. How you act creates a result. That's karma. So if you want to say that your longing for God is a desire for God, feel free. But act on it. And reap the benefits of that action. Another question in the back. about others, when I tell the mind, okay, show me this concrete fact that is true, right? I don't know this person is making these things up about me, right? Now, is this a form of repression when I question the mind? Show me a concrete fact. Oh, no way. That's not repression. That's analysis. When you're questioning the mind in that way, you're forcing the mind to state the facts, right? That is necessary. Everyone should be doing that. To repress it would be to say, no, 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 I don't want to deal with that. It's to avoid. Repression is avoidance. Right? When you go into it to analyze it, that's what we need to do. And based on facts, absolutely right. No question about it. In fact, that's a great um, measuring tool we should use in our meditation practice, and in our dream interpretation. Everything we see internally, 
in meditation and in dreams needs to be compared with facts. And if there are no facts to support it, we should set it aside and wait. Another question in the back? When the mind, during reflection, tries to change our memory, could we simply observe it and how it is changing things? Mm -hmm. Or should we try and stabilize it? That's a good question. So when the mind is... When we observe the mind is changing our retrospection of an event and trying to, trying to change the, what happened, what we see of it, should we stabilize it or just observe it? This depends upon the point of view you have in your meditation. The question implies that there is an instability in the mind, or rather in the consciousness. If your attention is not continuous... In other words, if you're in danger of losing the continuity of your awareness, that needs to be the first thing you pay attention to. You need to stabilize your meditation. So if the event that you're observing is causing you to lose awareness, and you're starting to slip into a dream or a fantasy or a memory or get distracted by your thoughts, the very first thing you need to do is center yourself and remember yourself and remember you're meditating, be mindful. Don't forget you're meditating. Right away. This is super critical. Because if you lose your mindfulness of meditating, you'll just start dreaming and you'll fall asleep. And you'll waste your time. Always retain that mindfulness. If the mindfulness is there, and you have a relative degree of concentration, but the mind is trying to alter the event, Yes, observe that. But furthermore, apply the analysis. As Samuel M. Vior stated and explained in his books, we need to coldly analyze everything that passes on the screen of the mind. And there are many techniques we can use regarding this. An example just cited is to use facts. So when we see the mind starting to change that event, we need to consciously remember, what are the facts of this event? What do I know is factually true? So as an example, you said, do I really know this person is saying these things about me? Did I hear them saying it? Or did somebody tell me that they're saying it? Or did I just think that they're saying it? So these are all different. But we respond to them all as if they're the same. A lot of the imagery and contents of our mind that we think is real is really just self-projected. What people think of us, what they say about us, whether we're successful or not. A lot of that is just projections of the ego. A lot of it is just stuff we heard from other people. Very little of it is based on facts. So bringing in the facts is important. The other thing you can do is bring in the opposites. Remember, I explained to you these eight worldly desires. And really, it's four sets of two. Positive, negative. Craving, aversion. We want that object, so we suffer because we want it. We don't have that object, so we suffer because we don't have it. But even when we get it, we suffer because we might lose it. Right? What's the answer? It's to renounce. To be the same, whether you have it or don't. To be in equanimity. And the same is true with name and fame and what people say of us and what they don't say of us. Everything. To be in equanimity. But that equanimity doesn't come through repression or indulgence. It comes through comprehension. Through understanding. Another question? How much detail should we go in the reflection to get the, the most out of the practice? To get the most out of re retrospection, how much detail should we go into? Well, now you're starting to reach the real beauty of this practice. Is that another question? No? If you go into the Salvation Army and folding, cleaning, and sorting clothing, and so no, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. <laughs> Let me answer the first question. The guy's holding his arm up the whole time, so I felt like something he wanted to add. Um, now you made me forget the first question. I'm just kidding. 
Um, state that first question again, clearly. Yeah. The question is about the detail, right? So the second question is not related? And the second question is not related to that? No. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. It's just plying me with questions. All right. As far as how much detail we should go into in retrospection, there is no rule in this practice. You have to listen to your heart. This practice is not mechanical. No one should be able to tell you, sit and spend 30 seconds on the first hour and 30 seconds on the next hour and 30 seconds, or spend an hour on the first hour. And that, if you're doing that, you're going to be there all day. You need to listen to your heart. What is your heart telling you that you need to meditate on? What caused pain for you or someone else? And how much time you spend on it depends on how much you want to deal with that pain. If it's something that is not significant to you, you're not going to want to spend any time on it. So if I tell you to spend an hour, you won't. You need to spend the time on it that you are naturally inclined to spend. And the same with the amount of detail you grasp. Look for the details that are relative and important. Clearly understand something here. The purpose of this practice is not merely to go back to an event and try to remember whether the person's shoes had laces or was pull-on. Or whether they were wearing black pants or dark brown. No, 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 no. These are not the reasons to do this practice. You're not trying to test your memory. You're trying to determine the facts and why suffering is occurring. It doesn't matter if you can remember every infinitesimal little detail about how their hair was styled or how the light was playing on the window in the background. None of that stuff makes any difference. Great, if you can remember it. Then you have a good memory and your imagination is working. That's great, but it doesn't matter. What matters is, can you understand the egos at play, the desires at work, how the personality is functioning, how the karma is functioning? That's what you need to look for. You need to remember the facts of what you felt, what you thought, what you saw, what you did, and in your environment. And then you reflect on those facts and analyze what is causing suffering and what will the results be of how I behaved. Another question? Perfect. That's exactly right. You're doing it the right way. When we are doing this analytical meditation, the first purpose is to comprehend the event, to get information about it. And what we want to be watching for is what you saw, something new, something unexpected, some new information. And it will happen. It will come. Every student who works with this technique will experience it. Where you are concentrated on an event and then something totally unexpected and without your will comes into your mind. Boop. A Hebrew letter, for example. Perfect. Beautiful. Now you have a choice. But your heart needs to answer it, not your mind. Do I meditate on the symbol that came or do I keep meditating on the event? Or do I meditate on both? And this needs to be determined by your own evaluation of how stable your meditation practice is and how clear and penetrating your imagination is. That's something only you can know. You'll know more if you study the techniques. In your case, you followed the letter and begin to analyze the letter. Great. There is a relationship between what you were meditating on and that letter. So you need to determine what is the relationship. Why did that letter appear? Your intellect will never be able to answer it it's not intellectual. 
You're getting information from your being. And you can't comprehend that with the mind. You have to comprehend it with the heart. So keep meditating. Well, at that point, you may want to explore a slightly different angle on the practice, which is to visualize the new information, but let go of the analysis and start to slip into um, more imagination, letting the imagination open up more. And that takes some skill because you have to be able to do that consciously. It's like going into the astral plane, same thing. To let the body relax more, let the mind relax more, and visualize that letter so that it starts to reveal more information to you. And oftentimes the analysis can get in the way. So it's a tricky spot. But if you can manage it, you can get more information and start to understand that. And that's why the master explained those three levels of inspiration, um, imagination, inspiration, and intuition. It takes time. I've had things that I saw in meditation 10, 20 years ago, and I still don't comprehend them. You know? And I still, from time to time, will remember, oh, yeah, I still don't get that, right? Maybe one day I will, I hope. But it's like that. Some things we get immediately, some things we get slowly, and we just have to keep working with what's most immediate. Yeah. Another question? Oh, here? Somebody? What? What? Nothing? Oh, yeah, easily. Little, little things that, that pop up and just reviewing only a few minutes of that. The key there is the difference, learning how to taste the difference between something that comes from conscious imagination and mechanical imagination. As you said, there are many things that can come in the mind. And the ego uses a lot of that to distract us, especially when we're working on eliminating something. So many things will start to come. But with some experience in practice, you start to learn the difference in taste between the distractions that are occurring in the mind as a matter of course and something that's coming from the being. There is a distinct difference, and I can't put it in words because it's not intellectual. It's something you have to taste with your consciousness that you will know it when it happens. And when it happens, then you need to determine, is this worth, which direction do I go into my meditation? Most of the time, especially in the beginning, most of what emerges is mechanical. It's just the mind. There was another question. To truly comprehend a book or a scripture, should we only study one book at a time without trying to study many at one time? So should we meditate? Should we, to comprehend a book, should we study one book at a time instead of many? In my personal experience, yes we have the tendency to read scripture the same way we read comic books. Or the way we read a cereal box. And this is a big mistake. A scripture is a locked treasure. You can see the outside of that box and admire it. But if you want to get what's inside of it, you have to meditate, you have to comprehend these short few lines that I read you today, the intellect, especially if you've studied spirituality for a while, they don't seem like a big deal because they really just condense the Buddhist teachings into a few short little lines. So a lot of students and, and people who study religion can read it and say, oh yeah, okay, I know it's in there, I get it. Big mistake. This text is special and the scripture I picked is special because of the experience that you can draw out of it, what's contained inside of it. But only your consciousness can retrieve that. And it's also true of all of the books given by Samael and Bior. Those books are extremely special. 
And let me give you a, a hint about that. There are many people who, with very good intentions, take out a dictionary and try to translate the writings of Samael into another language. And this is fine, with good intentions. I respect that. But if they don't comprehend the treasure hidden inside those lines, they cannot translate it. It's impossible. And thus the translation will be dead. And the same is true when we try to study a scripture and teach from that scripture. Or use that scripture in our daily lives. And all of us have the evidence. Every one of us has proven it already. Because every one of us has read probably hundreds of sacred books, spiritual books. And yet, how many of us have comprehended it? Have lived what those scriptures have taught? Very few. And thus, how can we claim to understand them? So it's a mistake, in my opinion, to read a bunch of spiritual books all at the same time or to read them rapidly. And Samuel and Vior gave a number of examples about that. He said about Great Rebellion, for example, he spent one year writing that book, and yet people sit and read it in a few minutes. It's outrageous, but we all do it. One of those, right? <laughs> Revolutionary Psychology or Great Rebellion. I think he actually said that story about both books. I believe so. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. The point of it is the point of the story. <laughs> Which is that? I didn't that. That we need to comprehend it. We need to learn to live by it. And the books of Samuel and Vior are the, a new level of teaching that is distinct from every other scripture that is on this planet. They are, they are something very special. Very sacred. And it's sad to see people treat them like newspapers. That they can, you know, read it quickly and toss it aside and think they understood it. No way. I've read some of those books 20, 30 times, meditating on those books, and I still find things in there I didn't know were there. Truly, humbly, profoundly amazed by what is in those books. You cannot read them fast. You won't get anything. You have to read them very slowly and digest them, practice them, contemplate them, analyze them. In the same way you do your retrospection practice, you need to analyze scripture, especially when a scripture affects you, when it hits you, and you're struck by it. There's a reason for that. You need that. Don't just toss it aside and go, wow, that was great. <laughs> it's not like drinking a coffee or eating a donut. Your heart, your soul needs that. Meditate on it, digest it, take it into your spirit. The consequences of that are beautiful. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, I was thinking about this that I might be okay at helping people, and you know, I, I might be able to do a lot of good things for people, but from the help I've gotten from my dean, he's a lot better at it. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, should, I should have him go with the help. No doubt about that. It's a beautiful question. Well, the answer is actually quite simple in my, in my experience. The first thing you have to do is reach the stage of being like that monk, right? To really, truly, and deeply have that sense of renunciation and compassion for others. Truly sincere. Not to do it because you feel like you have to, right? 
But you should help others because you truly, from the depths of your heart, have to do it. You have no choice. You have to. That's how you do it. Um, until that stage arrives for you, the best thing for you to do is to transform every action that you do into service to others. When we perform the factor of sacrifice, we always talk about how important it is to make donations or to teach or to spread the doctrine. And it's, there's no question those are important. But not all of us are teachers and not all of us have any money to share, right? But what we do have is a job, a daily life of family and friends and people we associate with. Let's transform our job into a spiritual practice. So instead of going to work with that dread of, oh God, I gotta go to work today. Instead, look at what your job is. Most people have a job that serves others in some way, right? So look at that job as, you know what, I'm actually going to work today to help someone. That's a beautiful thing. I'm going to work to help someone. Maybe with communication, maybe with money, maybe with their life situation, in any number of things. You can do so much good for humanity if you take your job that way. What about your marriage? What a huge opportunity that is to serve, to serve your spouse. How many people really take that? How many people take their relationship as an opportunity to serve? Not many. Most think, what am I getting out of this? Did he or she cook for me? Did he or she do my laundry? Did he or she clean? No. Right? Well, let's turn this around. If you're serious about wanting to enter the Mahayana teachings, let me tell you the prerequisite. Right? Actually, the prerequisite for entering, entering Tantra, which is the level of Pranya here. To enter Tantrayana, you have to have mastered Bodhicitta. And what is that? that every action you perform is not for you. Where are we in our level? Every action we perform is for ourselves. We're not ready for Mahayana or Tantrayana. We need renunciation. We need to renounce our selfish desires, seek to serve. That point of view of serving is what opens the doors of Mahayana to you, which is only the middle level right? But when you start to live by that through comprehension, through your actions, then Tantrayana, the real beauty of Tantra, emerges. Don't have the mistaken notion that Tantra is sex. It is not. That's a part of it. Real Tantra is how to transform energy, but it's based upon a strong foundation of renunciation and cognizant love. That is how Tantra becomes truly empowered and creates a bodhisattva. There's no other way. So your example, your questions are great about work and how to transform that. Take each action that you do and learn to do it for others. In the Bhagavad Gita, the way they initiate that process is Krishna says beautifully, do every action for me. That is a Shravakayana level of teaching. That is foundation. To do everything for God. To seek nothing for oneself. Everything you do, you do for Him. Your Divine Mother, your Divine Father. But see, that's basic level. And when you get that, when you start living that way, then you're introduced to the next level, which is now realize that God is in everyone else. So do for them as you do for God. That is bodhicitta. And that's in every tradition, every religion. We don't do it. We need to learn. Is there another question? Yeah. So we're done. See you next time. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. 
You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.